Welcome to Being Human. I'm your host, Richard Atherton. Kent Beck, author, programmer, artist, musician. Welcome. <laughs> All of those. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, great to, to talk with you. Awesome. And I've got I've to talk about the bow tie before we kick off. Uh, what a wonderful tie you have. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my, uh, my style coach uh, taught me a very important lesson a couple of years ago. He said, uh, you, you stand in front of your closet every morning and you ask yourself, who am I today? And whatever jumps out at you, that's what you wear. And it doesn't matter where you're going or who you're seeing or what you want them to think or how you want, like none of that matters near as much as who am I today? And I, I find that it's a wonderful moment of meditation. And sometimes it leads me to some pretty striking combinations. Um, but, uh, like if that's who I am today, like, okay, we're just going to deal with a white bow tie today. Awesome. I love it. I, I really love that. And, we, and of course, for those who are listening, but can't say you've got a whole stack of guitars in the background. So maybe we could get to that at some point in the conversation. You know? Oh, sure. Yeah. Hard, hard to avoid them. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, I, I thought we'd start where, you know, where I first got introduced to your thinking and that was back in 2000, I was a programmer, a Java programmer for the software engineers out there who, who know that. And I, we were creating a digital marketplace and our, our team leader sort of mandated that we all must read the extreme programming book. And we read it and we really took it on, right? There was no other, no other competing methodologies or ways we should be doing this project. So we just kind of embraced the whole thing wholesale. And, and that was my first experience as a professional software developer. And we were just rocketed through this project and we had this digital marketplace up, which is still going. It was it's a kind of an eBay, but for the scientific instruments niche. And, and that was kind of all I knew, right? That was my first sheep dunking. And then through, as I progressed through my software career. First, did you say first sheep dunking? Yeah, well, in terms of a methodology or no, a- No, 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 but as a, as, a, as a metaphor, I haven't ever heard that phrase. Well, I, I suppose, like, yeah, it's like, this is how you do things, right? If that's what the, the show. So I, I spent, I spent 17 years uh, as a goat farmer. So uh, uh, just, I, I, I got it. I got it. But I just, I just had to remark that, that I hadn't heard that one before. Okay. Um, so I was indoctrinated. Okay. indoctrinated, indoctrinated. Yeah. As far as I was concerned, in a good way, because it all kind of worked. And then as I progressed my software career, I went into these other environments and there's all these big Gantt charts and, you know, these weird and all this sort of estimation and everything's got sort of complicated and weird. And I was like, why aren't we just doing it how I did it on the first project? And, and then kind of for the next 10 years, I'm like, why are you all doing stuff in this strange way that just seems so over-engineered and unnatural? And, and I kind of built a career on it, really, I suppose, being an advocate for some of those ideas that I originally... Um, or it was exposed to in extreme programming and um and and had then taken a lot of that those those ideas and those concepts and helped people to apply them outside of software projects that's what i've been doing perhaps for the last five five to ten years i suppose um but be before i lose the audience completely maybe we should just start by for those who are not software initiates what what do we mean by extreme programming and yeah and what are the main ideas so uh, when I came up uh, uh, through computer school, we were taught that the way that you develop software is you think very carefully about what you're going to do first and foremost. And the way you think very carefully is you draw lots of diagrams and you write lots of text and you specify exactly what the system needs to do, not, not exactly how it's going to accomplish it. Um, and then you design exactly the computer system that will implement those ideas, and then you implement them. And um, of course, when you start implementing, you realize, A, this is not what we want the system to do, and B, even if that is what we want the system to do, the way we were guessing isn't going to work to make that happen. So, uh, But that didn't stop people from keeping trying to do that. And I think that's, it's a very natural human mistake to make. And, and really it's not a, it, it's a question of the order of the decisions. 
I was having this conversation with uh, with my son the other day. Um, it's it's nobody's saying you don't have to decide what the system has to do, but the question is, how much of it do you have to decide when? And uh, loading all those decisions up front is is a bet that you're not going to learn anything, which is just not a great bet. Um, so extreme programming. And when uh, you say a bet, you're not going to learn anything. I suppose what you really mean is that it's a bet that you've got it all right. And exactly what you've specified is the thing you need to do. And there's not, there's not going to be any surprises. It's right. Right. So, yeah. so if you were, uh, I mean, and I apply this same kind of thinking to all kinds of things in my life. So if I'm, if I'm starting a picture, um, uh, I don't plan out exactly what everything's going to be and then just go draw it because as I'm going along, I go, Oh, you know, the, the, some swirly stuff over here would be good. And then I just go do that. And it, if I had planned it out perfectly, I would end up with something worse. Uh, but this speaks to human thinking biases. Like we all kind of want to know what's going to happen. We're, af we're afraid of the downside, you know, what if this all goes horribly pear shaped and, s but trying to plan it out perfectly doesn't actually address that risk. Um, it just means that you have more risks. So extreme programming came along and really uh, the number one observation that's behind extreme programming is that this is a social process. Uh, a big part of that desire to plan out everything perfectly up front is if we can do that, then we don't have to talk to each other. And, and programmers are people generally, it's the stereotype, but it's the stereotype for a reason who aren't comfortable talking to other people. And th that's definitely me. I, I've, I've had to learn what skills I have along those lines, you know, by just hard work. Um, so the first observation is, one, this is a social process. So let's create an environment in which social interactions can happen. It's a little more predictable than, than just you know, talk to people. So once a week, you get together and talk about what you're going to do. And once a week, you get together and talk about what you did and what you might try to do next week. Um, on a daily basis, uh, uh, People who like to work that way will sit down together, two people at one computer, and uh, and work on stuff. So the social interactions were built into extreme programming, and then on the sort of the technical side is this observation that trying to make all those decisions about what the system is going to do, uh, packing them up front is just a bad idea. So we're going to make those as all along. And making the decisions about how the computer is going to do it, we're going to make those decisions as we go along. And the increments, like this one-week cycle that's built into human society and across the entire world, these one-week cycles should produce some value that somebody else can recognize. As opposed to, we promise in nine months, we promise in eight months, we promise in in seven months. Okay, now it's back to nine. Oh, it's going to be 12 now, right? That was kind of this receding this mirage of, of when the system's going to uh, actually appear. Replace that with once a week. Hey, here's what the system does. That's new. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. And then what I just got from that actually was that I'd never kind of clocked but the weekly cycle uh, does of course chime with what, how we organize ourselves there anyway. I thought that was a really obvious parallel. Never well, and for honestly, at first it was three weeks because I couldn't imagine anything shorter. Um, but one of the principles behind extreme programming is uh, to take advantage of the resources that are already there. And this weekly cycle is already there. It's already universal, like, why not just go with that as opposed to early on, there was kind of this Cambridge. Okay. So extreme programming came out. People went, Oh, this is crazy. Is this a cussing podcast or a not cussing podcast? Yeah, you can cuss. Yeah. Okay. There's all this crazy shit going on and we could do anything. So people would 
uh, try nine day cycles and four day cycles and all kinds of, of, of different stuff. Well, there's a reason for the seven day cycle. I mean, it may not be perfect, but everybody wouldn't use it if there wasn't something to it. So uh, having a, a weekly cycle, having a, a daily rhythm, a weekly rhythm, a monthly rhythm, a quarterly rhythm, all those things, like they're baked into the world that's around us. So uh, make use of those instead of inventing something else. Like, We're special, so our weeks are eight days long. Like, duh, knock it off, knock it off. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. It's about communication and letting go of this idea that we've we've got it all right up front. It sounds like those are the two of the two of the big ideas. Uh, uh, yes, yes. And then in response to that, uh, we're going to have an explicitly social process, and we're going to deliver value a little bit at a time instead of this promise of the big delivery at yeah. the end, which never happens. Right. But it's not going to stop us from trying to do it again. Yeah. And the other thing that I suppose for people who are exposed to some of these agile ideas, and it's, you still hear it. I mean, it's definitely a receding voice. But then there's this idea that, well, this is wonderful. And, and we've got these, these processes which really empower the developers and the programmers to, um, to work it out themselves. But then there's this risk that the developers kind of go off on their own direction and, and there isn't this control and this assurance that we're going to get the, the value that we want from them. And so, so do, you, do you ever experience that critique anymore? And do you have a response for that? Sure. So the, my first question always, uh, in, and I'm giving away consultant tricks worth millions here, is to always ask compared to what? So if somebody says, well, we don't, we don't know with this agile style, we don't know what we're, what we're going to get. Well, compared to what? Like you write everything down, discover it's not what you want. It's delivered late and it's not what you want. And it doesn't do like you, you didn't have that before. You don't have it now. Um, okay. Right. So th that's the first part of my response. And the second my, part of my response is, to expand what we mean by the team. So uh, first edition of extreme programming, the team was the programmers, very explicitly. Second edition, I grew up a little bit, and the team means everybody who's affected by the software in, in some degree. So if you're a person who, who cares about what, this, what effect this software is gonna have on the world, then you're in it and you can see it and you can make decisions at your appropriate level, whether you're an executive sponsor, uh, uh, someone who's paying attention to the effects in the world, say through data science or, or anthropology or however you do that, a salesperson, a designer, uh, uh, somebody who's uh, interested in how the software operates more than how it's developed, somebody who's interested in how it's developed. That's the team. And uh, however you want to be involved in that, at whatever rhythm you want to be involved in it, it's the team's job to make sure that you can step in, get oriented, offer your perspective, which doesn't mean your you know, that one person can dictate what happens, but, he, you know, he, hey, I would like things to be go more this direction. Okay, well, uh, you know, what's that cost? What do we give up? What are the alternatives? What are the consequences, short-term, long-term, all that? So I would say the, that fire and forget style, where you sign off on a big document, you know, in blood, and then nothing's ever gonna change. That doesn't actually give you control over what gets delivered when either. Right. So with, with this agile, you know, what came to be known as the agile style, you, you, you don't have control, but you certainly do have influence and visibility. That that's the that was the intent. What Agile's become is a whole 
but that, I mean, in the software world, so we're, we're trying to talk to people who have more sense than to be programmers, right? So, um, <laughs> well, I hope there are some programmers listening. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So, th so that, that makes sense, you know, compared to what, right? That's right. a great starting point. Are you really getting what you think uh, you need from from this other way of doing it, right? The traditional ways of doing it. Right. It's, it's sometimes, as it comes back to this consultant point, as a consultant, somebody will bring you in and say, "Oh, things are really horrible," and all you say is, "Well, compared to what?" And then, what? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then you say, "Well, but, you know, I need my big check, please." And they say, "But you're only here for 15 minutes," and you're like, "Well, that's not my problem." Right. Okay, so you, and you mentioned here how this, you know this the, this sort of agile movement kind of grew up right uh, post the you writing extreme programming. It wasn't really so much of a thing back then, right? In, in that sort of it wasn't a, it wasn't a thing at all. No, there was this all, yeah. there was this explosion. There were a bunch of different people who had their own take on, hey, this this waterfall style is just you know time out this is this is really bullshit and it doesn't actually work and and there are alternatives and there were a bunch of different voices and then eventually it became clear hey, we're going to we don't get along but we're we're going to accomplish more of our shared goals by pretending we do uh, than than we are by uh, by continuing to work separately right and and what's your reflection on the way because I mean, if you look at, say, some of those schools, say Scrum or more recently Safe, have become you know, big names and, and, and sort of almost on the on the tug of every chief technology officer and almost on the planet right now. And uh, an extreme programmer seems to operate. Uh, it's sort of in its in a. With, uh, so there are a few of those of us who are dedicated some of the ideas there or perhaps see it as some pure expression of the original idea, but it doesn't seem to have the same, hasn't had the same impact or the same growth as some of those other schools. You know, what do you attribute that to? Uh, interesting question. Uh, my perspective on it's certainly going to be biased. Um, I think that a huge part of the driver was economic. Scrum had built into it this business model. Extreme programming never, gener never generated an industry. There were consultants and there were some trainers, um, but, but it, it, it didn't grow in the same way that Scrum with its certifications. In. And I, I have my serious reservations about the whole idea of certifications and the way that it misaligns its incentives, which... Uh, you know, that's maybe a little too, we, we would say inside baseball, you might say inside cricket, um, you know, only people who are deeply involved would care about the minutia of that argument. But uh, Scrum was set up where, uh, with these certifications, where other, it made sense for other people to devote not just their talents and energy, but capital to supporting scrum and how it grew and the more it grew the more attractive it was to capital and so it grew more and 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 whereas extreme programming was um because uh, i mean it i just never could figure out how to build a business model in that i could live with you know in a moral sense um and so people who liked doing that would do it uh, it was very hard work in, in I mean, you, you had to confront your own limitations. Uh, you had to be prepared to be quite um, vulnerable technically. Like, I don't know. You know, you and I are sitting there and we're programming together. And if I don't know something, you know that I don't know that. And that, that feels uh, uh, scary at first, for sure. So it was hard work. It didn't have any sort of business model that would cause uh, capital to attract capital. Um, and uh, that it was also marketed to uh, people without a lot of decision-making power. The Scrum was marketed primarily to project managers who typically have more decision-making power than, than programmers, which is who extreme programming uh, was was marketed to 
So, right. Okay, uh, but so what's interesting there for me is what you talk about this moral resistance or this this struggle to find a business model that you could be morally comfortable with. What you know, what do you mean by that? What? Well, so so uh, I'm getting you're getting me in trouble here, Richard. So there there was this the the title at the time, and I'm I don't keep track of the of the details of how all this stuff uh, evolves, but was a certified scrum master. Um, you take a two day training and you get this title and you could put CSM after your name and it didn't actually mean anything. It, it, it should have been AST attended scrum training. Right. And, and you, you should have been embarrassed to put it after your name because it didn't actually mean anything, but certified oof, who doesn't want to be certified scrum. Okay already with the branding master who doesn't want to be a master. So, uh, it's a lie though, right? You're after two days, you're not a master. Anybody who certifies you is lying. And so to me, the, that whole edifice and then certified scrum trainers and certified scrum trainer trainers, and then blah, blah, blah. It's starting to look like a pyramid scheme to me. And none of it's honest. It's, it's built on this, hey, I want to look better than I actually am. But surely, me, a trainer, but surely a trainer would say, hey, I'm not lying. When I give someone a certificate, I've seen that they've shown up. Maybe they've done some kind of test, which proves to me they've understood certain concepts. So I can say they're certified as having understood a certain set of ideas. Understood, really? And you, you watch them apply them. Uh, you, you've watched them in some kind of edge case. I mean, you haven't, right? So any, it, it, at the end of this, if I could, if I said, well, I can certify, what, what, is, what does certify mean? If you go off and you mess up a project and I can get sued, that's a certification, right? If I, if I say, no, Richard's good for this, Richard goes and does it. He makes a bunch of mistakes. The project tanks, it costs $100 million. Somebody comes and consume me for that, then I have certified something. That means something. I'm putting, I have skin in the game at that point. If I say, I oh, know Rich is a good guy, and you go and blow $100 million, and somebody comes to me, I'm like, oh, my God, yeah, it's not my problem, right? You, you hired him. That's, that's the level. So it, certif it's, it's not a certification. That's why it should be attended scrum training. Because I, you know, if I'm the trainer, I can say, oh, Richard sat in the seat for two days. I, I promise Richard sat. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give him this piece of paper, even if he gave me the $2,000. I wouldn't give him this piece of paper if he hadn't sat in that seat. Okay, well, that's honest. And, and I brought this up at the time, and the answer was, well, then nobody would come to the classes then. Okay, and then, like, but you would build you would build this on a base of honesty. I, I'm not clever enough to try and build an edifice on uh, deceit, and that's how I see it. You know, I oh, this is gonna piss some people off, but there you go. I'm back. I'm not. I'm off the goat farm. Look out. <laughs> Yeah, great. No, no. I mean, I, and I can totally understand the perspective. I mean, what would be great, of course, to have you head to head now with, uh, with uh, you know, somebody from that, from one of those organisations. It would be great to to sort of duke it out. But um, I, I'm certainly sympathetic to your view, and you know, I've I've resisted all of those trainings uh, because for exactly the same moral reservations. So you know, uh, um, and I, I don't have a problem with somebody who whose mission is to teach about these topics and who adopts that branding because it gets them in the door and they genuinely teach the topics to the best of their ability. I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with the structure as a whole. Yeah. And I, in funny ways, I think it sort of feeds into the same, almost the same 
the same human desires that drive this 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 need to 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 define everything up front and be sure that it's going to work kind of plays into the same sure. idea you know if, but if i just get someone who's certified you know if i just get somebody who's got a, a step mas- not a, not just someone a master richard a master i wow wow yeah can't do better than that then then i'm gonna be you know then i'm gonna be okay i think i oh, think yeah. i think that's got to be part of the of, of I, the, the bias psychology that drives like it. my my hat is off to the people who came up with that branding for accomplishing that purpose right if they wanted to attract people's attention they wanted to get trainers wanting to be certified as trainers so they could certify other people they accomplished their purpose in a way i never did right so this is me kind of you're welcome to say sour grapes you know this is me in a little apartment with guitars fine but uh you know going yeah you know so dishonest <laughs> but like okay so f- fine what did you accomplish well you know i i did what i did and i didn't ac- i would have loved to have had extreme programming take off in that same kind of way right I didn't make it happen. So, yeah, feel, I mean, take take what I say with a grain of salt. Right, yeah, and there's no there's no one truth in, in this conversation, right? I mean, it's complex and there are different factors at play. I mean, I know one of the things that people say who are probably most sympathetic to your views, say, like a, a friend of mine who's been through the safe training, for those who are not aware, that's a, a particular view on how we organise ourselves, ourselves in, for very large groups of developers to work in an agile way. And he's like, yeah, I know, it's kind of all a bit of a racket. And, you know, the certification, you know, doesn't really make sense. And, 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 but, you know, I learned some things, you know, and some of, I've cherry picked some of the best bits of it. And, you know, it's been very useful in my conversations with clients. And as you actually pointed to, it, sometimes it just is a way to get me into the conversation to then ha- perhaps, yeah, explore more nuanced views on how we might do things. So, so there is, there is that perspective, I suppose, on it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you can you can look at a, a both harm and good done in within that framework. Um, I think that there are better alternatives, um, but the first step is you have to take responsibility, and that's a scary thing. Some places that's not a safe thing to do to take to say, well, we're going to develop software I what uh, our way. So. I worked at Facebook for seven years, 2011 to uh, uh, to earlier this year. And people would say, oh, is Facebook doing this agile stuff? I'm like, no, Facebook, ha- Facebook does things the Facebook way. You know, and I can, I can talk for hours and hours about what constitutes the Facebook way. But if somebody wants a really good software development process, it's, it's going to have to be their process. They're going to have to figure out what goes in the week, what goes in the month, what goes in the quarter. Different parts of the organization will probably be on different rhythms, managed different ways, which is one of my big lessons out of Facebook. Um, but it, it's going to be your way. So, you know, some giant bank comes to me and says, oh, we want you to help with our agile transformation, you know, which to them means uh, scrum everywhere. Or something like that and i just like no i don't i don't do that i can help you be more like you or, or they'll come to me and say well we'd like to be more like facebook i'm like no i can't teach you how to be more like facebook i can teach you how to be like you at your best i that i can do but but this idea that that you're gonna bring in some style from the outside and it's magically going to fit into your culture that's just bullshit that's the the I, and I, yeah i understand people like it's hard to take responsibility and go i understand everybody does things you know and there's all these other companies and they say oh we do things the safe way or the scaled agile way or the uh you know the the horoscopic way or whatever it is we're going to do things our way we're going to learn some lessons there 
we're going to flop around, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to have problems, but in the end, we're going to be who we are, just a whole lot better than we are today. That's a scary th thing, because like the the in-between states can get really messy and a bunch of latent disagreements that just never were brought up before are going to come right in your face. You know, like if you got two groups competing for the resources of developers, the, the common organizational response to that is just have the developers fail and then fight it out. But you can point to the developers failing as opposed to in an extreme programming style, the b both the people who are competing for programming resources need to get in a room and hash it out before they start telling the programmers, hey, this is, you know, go that way. Right. So and, yeah, if surfaces, it's a, yeah, it surfaces disputes, it surfaces. Yeah, and it gets people in the room to have the conversations that need to be happening. I think that is what's common to all of these methods, in a sense, is that they encourage a deeper conversation, more regular communication. They encourage you to get into in a room, right? And that was the idea. I would say that was the idea 20 years ago. Uh, whether they actually do that or not today, I I would dispute that. I think it's a lot. It's a lot easier to say, "Hey, everybody's going to be happy." Right. But hang on, if I come back on that, like, so let's just take, we are getting into the weeds here, but hey, for those of you who are into this, <laughs> fine, All we'll right. get on to goat herding. We'll get to the guitars before we're done, we promise. <laughs> so let's just take SAFE, for example, right, the Scale Agile Framework, and one of their set pieces is, right, the, the program increment meeting where they get, you know, maybe it's 100 developers in a room together, and that's, so for me, that's 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 true to some of the essence of the ideas around are agile and in terms of people getting into communication and hashing things out together. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about safe. I, right. I you know I kind of looked at the cover and I'm like, right. nah, no, nah, this is nah. Like if somebody can take it and make it work, great. I can't, so that's fine. Right. Okay. No, um, fair enough. But what well, I getting, love getting a hundred developers in the room is a very different thing than getting two business sponsors with contradictory uh, uh, goals in a room. That's a hard thing, right? And and as a as a, a like a process consultant, you you come in and you say, well. Yeah, we could start writing tests and we'd we'd stop having so many bugs in production. That's not gonna solve anything. Because what really matters is two, two people saying, hey, go that away. So let's get those people together. And they're like, well, we don't we don't agree. What you're coming in here and stirring up all this trouble. Well, I I stirred, it's true. The trouble was already there at the bottom of the soup. I stirred, it now floats to the surface. You can point to me and say, hey, why'd you cause this trouble? And my, my response as a, a not terribly socially smooth person is like, hey, I didn't cause it. I can't fix it. You know, kind of the Al-Anon thing. What's the, I didn't cause it, I can't fix it, and something or other. Anyway, like, you already had this disagreement. Uh, you now you have it now when it's visible and you can do something about it as opposed to waiting six months or nine months or 12 months and spending a million, 10 million, a hundred million plus all the opportunity cost. And now you know about it. Like I, in my naive world, that's a better thing to have that surfaced up front and be able to deal with it and have more visibility and options. Right. Yeah. But as we've seen, uh, that's, that's a much uh, more difficult sell than the ones which says, here's the framework, we'll put it in place. I had, uh, I was in South Africa at Agile Africa. And um, somebody came up to me and said, well, we want to do software development, but we, 
we just can't stand all this ceremony and this agile stuff. We want, we just want to write some programs. And I, tears came into my eyes. Like, how, how can it be that, that we who set out to refocus development on essentials and get rid of stuff that didn't matter. How, how can it be that we're right back where we were 20, 20 years ago? Like, how can it be that this is too much ceremony? I, you know, I was on a goat farm for 17 years. I kind of didn't notice all this happening. And uh, so now I come back, I'm like, no, no, this is, no, this is wrong. I don't know what to do about it, uh, but uh, yeah. Well, well, I mean, that's an interesting point. And maybe it's the pendulum swung too far. So maybe these early ideas, you know, let's, let's get away from all the documentation, all the artifacts and, and, and have people talking to each other, especially programmers who may find it difficult to, to socially interact. So let's sort of create a little bit of encouragement in the system to have those interactions happen. Uh, and maybe it's gone too far the other way. Maybe that's true. And, and, and now it's become wasteful in itself. All of the ceremonies in the, the uh, no, I think we're I think we're exactly back where we started from. I, I, in many cases, it's it's the the human tug of let's just decide exactly what the system's going to do, so we don't have all this craziness. Uh, uh, when we discover no, that's not what we wanted to do. Let's just let's get back to that. You know, so you'll. It, it, it's different words now. So somebody will say, uh, first, we need to validate the business model. So we're going to do focus groups and we're going to, to, to do these tests and da 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 Okay. And now we need to, uh, do, you know, but it's just validation. Well, it, the result is a big fat pile of information that would have looked very comfortable in those gigantic analysis documents that we used to write it's the same thing it's it's got different uh, you know slightly different motivations and different vocabulary because there have been oh, my waterfalls bad but let's validate the business model okay now let's now let's uh, validate the architecture because you know architecture is important so so we need to just we need to just validate it before we just do a bunch of programming based on on incorrect assumptions right who could argue with that well that's that big fat design document that we wrote sat on the shelf did nothing then there's some implementation the only improvement we've made to the process is that we have customers instead of testers right so but it's it's exactly waterfall it's, it's back to exactly waterfall, as opposed to saying, let's start with the assumption that we're going to learn stuff. And because we're going to learn stuff, that means everything needs to be prepared to change. Let's start with that assumption. We're, it's going to be a completely different process. There is no autopilot for software development, right? We can't dial in a destination and then just the plane takes itself off and flies itself and lands and we get off. That's, that's, that mental model just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, that mental model didn't change. It went underground for a while because it was so out of fashion, but now it's popped up its, its ugly head and, and it's just so sensible. It sounds so adult. You know, let's, let's get this architecture right so we don't have a bunch of thrash because we have to change the architecture. Who could argue with that? Well, because you can't get the architecture right. One of the advantages of working on Facebook is no one was tempted to, for a long time at any rate, no one was tempted to make a statement like that because they knew, like, we don't know what feature is going to blow up. When it blows up, it's going to blow up bigger than any feature ever has in the history of ever. And we have no idea how we're going to implement the system that would satisfy that need when that need actually arises. And if we tried to over-engineer just in case, some other feature would blow up and the whole edifice would come down. 
So the, the whole engineering culture was based on improvisation. We're going to have to react. We know we're going to have to react. So let's prepare to react as opposed to trying to get it right up front or get it right before we start. So, and we're gonna have to do that 24 seven, 365. There's never a weekend we can take Facebook down. So every change has to be incremental. All the risk management has to happen, but it's gonna have to happen mostly in production because that's where the problems occur. So we have to build reversibility into our process where, we can make decisions and then unmake them. Oh, that's more expensive. Boo-hoo, you don't have a choice, right? So, so there's a bunch of effort in Facebook engineering goes into making sure that decisions can be unmade. When, when Facebook buys new networking equipment, the, the characterization lab is not there to find out whether the, the, the equipment behaves as specified. It, it's there entirely to see if you can turn it off. And then you, because the load, the, the context, the scale is always going to be something that this equipment has never seen before. So, so like, you know, the, the vendor says however many terabits per second, like whatever, right? Maybe, maybe not, but it's really important. Can if we switch this thing on, can we switch it off? It's all about reversibility. That's a really powerful idea, actually, because I mean, you won't. You're really speaking to there is you know the assumptions we make about the world. Because right. if we make an assumption about the world, which is, I don't know how this could blow up. I, it's unpredictable, and this this change could bring the whole thing down. So if you, if that's your assumption about the world, I can, I literally cannot predict what. Even a, the smallest change may, may, may have in the world. That's a that's a really really hard sort of attitude to adopt towards the world, right? And but if you do take that, wait, wait, wait. Com compared to what, Richard? Compared to the <laughs> attitude that we can predict and then we really can't. That really sucks. But, right. I mean, I get that, but uh, yeah. Uh, like if you've been steeped in that in that mythology, oh yes, you know I I will be able to predict how users are going to behave. That's always the biggest risk in any business system, anything. I can predict how users are going to behave uh, based on a, a novel stimulus. Like, sure, if if we make that assumption, we can do a whole bunch of stuff based on that assumption, but it's all wrong. You know, and then you 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 refine and you refine and you refine, and then you put it in front of people, and then they don't behave the way you expected them to behave. Or you can get something out there in a safe, reversible way, put it in front of people. They don't behave how you expected them to behave, but you've got tons of options at that point. I would much rather be in that position. Right, and and, and I can also see how it's. That's a kind of a, you know, you could also take the other type, which is not that that's a really hard assumption to make. It's like, it's a relief. Oh, it's okay. It's okay that, and, and you're right. And the world is unpredictable and it's okay, right? And, and we're going to, to adapt. We're going to pay attention. We're going to respond. We're going to adapt. And, and it's, it's, Oh, that process is, is okay, it's safe, it's safer than trying to predict. So like my, my Twitter feed is a good example. I'm at Kent Beck and I've been at it on Twitter for whatever, several books worth of tweets while I haven't written any books in that amount of time. And I can't predict which tweets will blow up. Right? I, could, I could take a topic and write a whole book about it, spend thousands of hours, and then discover, oh, nobody wants to hear me talk about whatever it is. Or I could put a tweet out, and then another tweet out, and then I think, ah, oh, this is a really good one, and I put it out, crickets. And then I put out, I mean, the latest one was about how to, how to write an abstract so your paper gets accepted at conferences. Little tweet, 
put it out there, it blows up. Well, if I'm focused on predicting, I'm never going to put that one out there because like who could possibly care about that? Except they do. And now I know something. And if I was a sensible person who followed up on opportunities like that, I would go and, you know, write more about that and, and uh, build a workshop and da, 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 you know, follow up on that. Um, I'm, I'm such an explorer that I just want to go to the next thing. So well, that, it feels to me like temperamentally, you're an improviser, right? And you enjoy absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, there are places for careful analysis. And this is, uh, we're, we're getting close to time, but I'm, I'll give you this. And this is, this is the big lesson for me from seven years at Facebook is, if you look at the development of any idea, you get this kind of S-shaped curve. In the beginning, you're fumbling around and you don't know. And then something blows up and now you're growing really quickly. People are yelling at you because your product doesn't work the way they want it to work. That's wonderful news because a week ago, nobody cared at all. And now they care enough to yell at you. So all you have to do is satisfy them and you've got a success. Before, you didn't even know what anybody cared about. But that's a big shift in mindset. That exploratory phase, that early phase, is just lots of experiments. The shorter the experiment can be, the better, because so you can have more experiments with more diversity and you can try out more things. It needs to be safe. That is, you know, if you're doing this inside of a giant company, you can't cause privacy leaks or data loss or give money to criminals or whatever. It needs to be safe, but it also needs to be experimental in this kind of the this kind of diverse way but then something takes off and you have to shift gears and you go from this hey loosey goosey let's try crazy stuff um that kind of style to oh time to focus figure out what features are really important throw away features that that turned out weren't important so that you can make this thing work for the person who's yelling at you today and then next week, it'll be a different person yelling at you for a different reason, and you need to be able to focus on that. And then the next thing, and the next thing. That's this vertical growth phase. But those are completely different processes. And Facebook early days, those were managed in a completely different way. Different team structure, different people involved oftentimes, different rhythm to it. And then eventually, that growth starts to become predictable. So you have this explore, expand, and then uh, the extract phase. That's when you've got a team of 100, and you've got a lot to lose. And that's when this, uh, the XP value of courage, bad idea. When you're in this extract phase, the, uh, being chicken is great. Going and analyzing first to make sure yeah, okay, we're going to make this change. We're not going to, we're not going to like get all of our users to leave if we make this change. That game is a completely different game than vertical growth, which is completely different than that early exploration. So explore, expand, extract. And seeing them as separate games, having different people, sometimes different technology stacks, sometimes a different, a certainly different management style, different amounts of capital. You know, these explorations should be cheap little things. I want those to be on a tight budget. Okay, now, now something is growing really rapidly. I just shovel money at it. Doesn't matter because when we time comes to ka it's going to be so much money, it, we won't even care because we're just scaling. And, we, and risk is the highest... The, the, the risk of not scaling is the danger. And then, then you have to pay attention to ROI because you say, oh, well, you know, we have 10,000 servers and now we can get to 8,000 servers if we do blah, blah, blah. Good cost reduction. You know, that's uh, uh, whatever, $4 million a year. That's worth doing. Um, but it's a very different style than than these explorations where you just like, yeah, go try that for a month. We'll see how the users behave. Oh, the users, you know, didn't love it. Stop doing that. Do something else. Fine. Um, so uh, uh, that was for me the big lesson. How did I get on this? 
I'm hoping you're keeping track. I, I, no, I, no, I mean, you t- we, t- we started with reversibility and we talked about how, but I suppose what's interesting to me in that is that, and, and, these, and then I, I was talking about you, you being temperamentally improvisational and that makes a lot of yes, sense in the early you. phase. And then perhaps as you, you scale, you're, you still do some improvisation, but maybe not so much. It's not so much a, a jazz orchestra. Maybe it's getting a little more structured in, is that right? And then expand. So, so, so uh, in that expansion, that vertical expansion phase, you're purely reactive. What's breaking? We're, we're out of servers. We're out of bandwidth. We're out of disk space. We're out of floor space. Uh, we can't hire people fast enough. Like it's just going to be one thing after another, after another. And you have to react because the next thing that kills you that could kill the next existential crisis is going to be something that emerges. So it's improvisate. The, the first part's improvisational where like we're drinking over beers and we're like, if we just got rid of those three buttons, nobody would use this. You're like, well, how hard is it to do that? Well, I don't know. Let's just go do it and see what happens. So that's improvisational in that sense. Vertical expansion is improvisational, but it's, uh, you're being driven by external factors. Like, what, what are people screaming about this week, which is different than what they screamed about last week, and it's going to be different than, if we're successful, what they're going to scream about next week. So it's, it's reactive. Uh, and then eventually you get to this growth is predictable, and we have run books, and we've got plans, and we just know when we introduce into a new, you know, into a new city, like here, here are the things that we know we need to do. We've introduced into 20 cities and now we're going to go into 50 more. Like to me, I, that you're absolutely right. I'm down here and explore by the time it's like, I don't want to introduce to the 21st city. Like that's just doesn't do it for me. And thank goodness. There are people who just love that, right? They're like, okay, I've got my book. I've got my city, get out of my way. I'm just going to execute the hell out of this. Super, you know, we need those people, but that's just not my thing. Right, but if you're in this exploit phase at the top, so you've scaled it, you've got something that works, you're exploiting. I, I prefer I prefer extract. Sorry, it's extract, sorry. Slightly Wrong. less negative. Okay, extract. The Are we then doing something that's akin to waterfall or, or not? Well, okay, so the, the whole way I saw this curve was looking at people trying to do waterfall and thinking, well, what if they're not idiots? What if they're just solving a problem that I don't care about? And that's when I, that's when I realized, okay, if you have a lot to lose, waterfall does try to do this careful analysis stuff. So I, what, the way I would say it is a little backwards to the way you said it. Waterfall is trying to do an effective job of extraction, but by abandoning uh, feedback, they actually end up creating a lot of waste. If you try and apply waterfall to exploration, you're just screwed from the get-go because you're going to try and make this whole beautiful, perfect, you know, let's design everything exactly perfectly you launch it and discover nobody cares. Well, you, if, if what you cared about, if, if what you wanted was the answer to the question, does anybody care? You could have done that in a week. It didn't, wouldn't have taken you a year. So that's an even bigger mistake, applying waterfall to exploration. I think that there, there are, somewhere out there, there's an effective way to do extraction or an, uh, like a family of ways to do extraction in an efficient way. And it's going to look very different than waterfall, but it's also going to look very different than effective ways of doing exploration. Right. And are you also saying though, in this ex- extract phase, that reversibility is, is paramount? Is that still yeah. true? Oh, absolutely. Because you're at scale, there's still risks. There's still unknowns. They're just at a kind of smaller scale. So if you, if you look at a little bit of the extract curve, if you zoomed out on that, what you'd see is a bunch of little projects, each of which is its own little S curve. You're like, well, how are we going to, how are we going to make this part of the system a little bit more efficient so we can use fewer servers? 
Well, if you already knew how to do it, you would just do it. So you're going to have to do a little bit of exploration. And then one of those ideas is going to take off. And so you'll make sure that it takes off. And then there'll be a, a, a long tail of further incremental improvements on that idea. But that's just a little part of this curve, which if you add it up, if you, if you aggregate a bunch of those little curves, it looks like a nice smooth, okay, this quarter uh, we've reduced costs by 20%. Well, it didn't, it didn't really come it, at the end of the quarter. We actually tried a bunch of things, maybe even some in parallel, uh, and then add it all together, it looks like you get 20% per quarter. Right, right. That makes sense. Okay, how much more time have we got? Well, that's an hour. I'm I'm more concerned about your uh, your listeners' uh, attention span. I've kind of gone off here a little bit. No, no, I love it. No, I'm sure they can. Tell, I'm I'm sure they they're they're, they're highly uh, entertained by this. And um, and well, well, the ones who are listening to you say that are. It's the, it's the thousands that have already dropped, millions, I don't know, that have already dropped off that I'm more worried about. But then there's nothing I can do about it now. Exactly. We're past that point. So let's, let's, let's uh, keep going. So the other thing I had a your question. So, I mean, you sharing about Facebook is wonderful. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be you know, really interested in that. And what, what would you say if there's anything about Facebook that, that lacked? You know, was there anything there that you felt like, ah, you know, there's some things here that they could be doing better? And are you under NDA? Can you even answer that question? Um, uh, yes, I can answer that question. Uh, am I legally allowed to? I, you know, it's, that's going to be up to the courts to decide um, at, at some point. So I, when I joined Facebook, it was uh, 2,000 employees. Uh, when I left, it was about 25,000 employees. And... Uh, here's, here's what I would try to give you the short version of what I think kind of went wrong. Uh, Facebook's culture is very focused on, uh, you know, there's a six month review cycle and every six months you need to prove what impact you had on Facebook as a whole. And that word impact is a really important kind of magical word and has a very special meaning inside of Facebook. So uh, you should be able to say, here's the metric that I cared about and here's what I did and here's the effect that I personally had. And you need to do that every six months and I need to do that every six months. That focuses everybody on the upside of what they're doing, which going back to this S curve, if you're exploring stuff, being focused on the upside is fine. You got nothing to lose. Uh, uh, you're trying out a bunch of different things in this six month cycle. You try five, 10 different things. One of them is going to work out better than the other five. Multiply that by 2000 employees, like a bunch of good stuff's going, going to happen. So that's an appropriate focus while you're still exploring a space. Now you're expanding rapidly impact still is a good criteria because everybody's focused on where's the next bottleneck? What kind of magic do I, can I bring to it? So I can, at the end of the six months, I can say, well, you know, remember these things were crashing and blah, blah, blah. And we were running out of this and I did my magic. And then we weren't running out of servers anymore. Super. You're focused on the upside of what you're doing. The problem gets when you come to the extract phase as a company, which Facebook, you know, certainly is in, in terms of number of users, right? We're running out of people on the planet to use Facebook. We, they are running out of people on the planet and, and you know, any rumors that we're going to put uh, dolphins and primates is completely... I can deny those rumors categorically, extraterrestrials, same thing. Not been experimenting with goats. Absolutely not going to happen. So uh, now you've got a lot to lose. Facebook, the company, is still focused on what's your impact, Richard. 
So let's say you want to add a, you're working on a Facebook Messenger for Android and you think, oh, here's a feature that'll cause people to send more messages. So you work on your feature and you try and experiment and it maybe goes up by 0.1% of messages sent and that's not quite enough and so you tweak, tweak, tweak. You get close to the end of the six months. You need a win or bad things are going to happen in, in your review. So you, all of your incentives are, how can I take this idea and, hey, this variant of the experiment said plus 0.2% message sent. I'm going to ship that, period, because there's upside that reflects on me. What if there are other downsides? Like that makes it easier for somebody to social engineer extracting private information or what if uh, uh what if it just makes the the app more cluttered like you have no incentive to look at the downsides of what you're doing because all the incentives that are being applied to you are all about the upsides of what you're doing at some point and here's never going to happen you say well yeah a few more messages get sent but I, this doesn't seem right. Like, on balance, I'm not going to put this feature in because on balance, I'm not comfortable with the downsides. If you do that, you're screwed. No one is ever going to make a good decision that, that then makes their own review harder. At some point, Facebook needs, I believe, to switch from focusing on impact to focusing on the quality of decisions. Problem with focusing on, like, if you made that decision, you said, well, here's this feature, but oh, it's just not quite like, no, no, we're not going to put this in. And if that's the right decision, you should be rewarded for that. The way Facebook runs currently, there's no way to reward someone for making a good decision like the quality of decision making. The problem with quality of decision making then is your, you, then it kind of devolves to your ability to present this as a good decision. Right? The data is the data. Of course, you can gain the data, but at least it's, there's something there someplace, as opposed to saying, well, you know, I worked on several complicated uh, features and uh, didn't ship any of them, and that was the right thing to do. You know, and if I can, if I can present that in my uh, Peter Ustinov voice or wh whatever I was trying to do there, uh, then, <laughs> then thank you for that feedback, Richard. Uh, if I can present it well, I'm, I'm golden for the rest of my career. I can just keep saying, oh, I tried. I didn't ship it because it wasn't right. He piles of gold on me, right? That's what you, that's the risk that you open up by by trying to reward good decision making instead of trying to reward this individually attributable impact. Yeah, I can see how that pretends to, might tend to re reward great advocates and orators and politicians and people who can sell their wisdom as opposed right. to great engineers, right? right. So, so uh, but, but, but at a certain scale, you need to incentivize looking at the downsides of decisions as well as the upsides. Right. Or you have societally significant impact that you didn't intend. Right. And actually, as I say that, maybe it's a bit unfair to, to compare that skill set with an engineering skill set because it's perfectly possible that, a, you know, a great engineer looks at something and says, oh, hang on, you know, if I think about this more widely and a lot of the waters that Facebook's sailing into now, you know, are, are kids getting addicted, you know, what, is the, what are the social downsides of, of of, of us spending so much of our lives on so on all of these complex societal questions right i mean right. Um, yeah i mean it, it, it's it's uh it's a it's a deep sort of human quality that allows us to be able to explore or not explore those those types of questions right and you're going to be affected by the incentives that are around you yeah we all are right and was that a conversation that was live in Facebook, like what you've just brought up, or is that was just a sort of personal insight? Well, I I got fired trying to have it. So, wow. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I hadn't, hadn't appreciated that. Um, 
There are certainly people who care about it, but they also have a review in six months. And yeah, I mean, so it, it, it is a conversation. There are, and, and I would say, there, there, I heard a gajillion conspiracy theories about Facebook. And from the inside, I, nothing seems true to me. Oh, they're just money grubbing, trying to make the absolute most money they possibly can. No, that's not how it feels inside, for sure. Uh, but that's different than saying, uh, and there are people who care deeply about the societal impact of what they're building, for sure. Sometimes the, the large-scale emergent impact of a feature is absolutely unpredictable. So just saying, oh, well, why, why can't they be more ethical? About what? You know, uh, yeah, why don't just predict those unpredictable outcomes and everything will be fine? Sure. You know, now we're, we've cycled back to the beginning of our conversation here yeah. this hour. Just create so, your ethical framework and follow that. Right? Exactly. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Well, because people are still inside this incentive system that incentivizes certain kinds of thinking. And, you know, if you have plenty of slack, you'll spend time on doing things right. And as the screw tightens and you get, closer and closer, you're going to act more in concert with the, the formal incentive process. Hmm. And, and how do you feel personally then about having experienced that exit? Where, where did it leave you? <sighs> well, uh, so the... Uh, uh, the uh, the first feedback filter, uh, FFF, is uh, what of this is about me and what of this is about them. So anytime I receive a piece of feedback, whether it's, uh, you know, oh, thank you so much for what you've written. You know, you saved my life and, and uh, my children are alive today. Like, well, what of that is about the person giving me the feedback and what is it about me? Or, and and the reverse is also true. You know, you you bastard, uh, you know, my wife left me and I lost my house and whatever, and it's all your fault. Well, what of that is about the person giving me feedback and what of that is about me? So uh, no longer having a way to, f to contribute at, at Facebook inside the formal organization says a lot more about Facebook than it does about me, but it does just say some things about me. You know, I can be uh, I can be abrasive. I can be uh, unaware. I was going to say like thoughtless or clueless. It's not that I'm. There's some thought that I should that I'm capable of of uh, of having that I choose not to. It's that I'm just like oh, I didn't know people would be pissed off if I said that. So. Uh, uh, not being able to predict the consequences of the things that I say, those are lessons for me. And there's some things I can work on and get better at. And there's other things where like, nah, I'm okay being this kind of abrasive asshole. Um, uh, so um, where am I left? Like uh, I Facebook outgrew me. Okay. This is like, a, that's a reasonable summary. Would I have liked to continue? You know, I when I arrived, it just looked like chaos. Just a bunch of clowns doing whatever. And took me five years to figure out this explore, expand, extract that no, it's not, it's not chaos. It's that there's three different styles going on here. Um, and Facebook, certainly in the early days, did a great job of executing all three of them. Um, and then, like, what I had to offer in the way that I had to offer it was not things, uh, like, that was a big mystery. It took me five years to, like, parse out the mystery. And then I'm like, well, what's the next thing that Facebook has to teach me? I didn't really have one. I tried to make stuff up that I thought would be interesting, like, 
helping teams work together better when all the incentives were individual incentives. Turns out that's not possible, at least not for me. Um, so yeah, I was kind of done. The, the big things I had to learn, I had learned. Um, and the things that I could contribute, the upside of my contributions was exceeded by the downside of my attempting to contribute. Okay, so Facebook. Like, I feel, I feel intensely grateful. Uh, uh, it was wonderful to be part of that and to see the growth in the evolution and to, you know, on, on occasion introduce features that helped millions of people express something about themselves. It's a great feeling. It's, a, it's addictive. I can understand that. Um, but now that I don't have a f big thing I can learn there and uh, they don't have a way to take advantage of what it is that I'm good at, well, okay, it says a little bit about both of us. And time to move on. Hmm. Well, thank you for being uh, yeah, so honest about, about that. Um, one of the things I'd like to talk about on the podcast is, and it just pricked my ears, was about working on ourselves as being part of what we do to be better humans and you talked about there's some things you maybe you like and actually being an abrasive asshole in some senses is a good thing right and i could totally buy that and you talked about there may be some aspects you'd like to work on have you got a sense yet of where you you might want to go to work on yourself and, and where's next for you on, on in that respect um i have uh, uh yeah this is this is quite fresh so we'll see how this comes out um so extreme extreme programming was based on this idea of creating safe social inter interactions for people who who might not have a natural talent for it or natural affinity for that. Uh, I worked hard at getting though some of those skills myself. Um, I don't have a natural affinity for it, but you know, it turns out that hard work. You, you can make a lot of progress. Um, I have a, a, a partner now who is way better than I am at this. So we'll be part of a conversation and we'll review the conversation and she'll tell me everything she saw going on. And there are so many layers that I totally missed. So uh, I'm kind of going through a, uh, what's the, uh, the, 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 uh, molting. I'm molting. I've gotten a little too big for my skin and now it's, now it's uncomfortable. Like the level of understanding that I had, but oh, I hate this feeling like, Oh no, I'm, you know, for a geek, I'm socially, uh, socially adept. Uh, it turns out now there's just this whole universe of stuff that I was completely missing. I have no concept about and it's the kind of game where if you don't play, you're losing. And that's not good enough for me. So uh, understanding the next level of subtext of human communications is, is the, uh, like a big thing that I need to do. Part of which is working on, on like just myself becoming more aware of, of more things that I had been ignoring. Part of it is getting mental models for understanding like just the the expectation that these kinds of interactions can be going on. Um, a part of it is the um, emotional control of not getting overwhelmed. So I play poker uh, fairly seriously. And that's also a study in emotional control, right? Something you, you do the right thing and there are bad consequences and can you hold it together? The more you can do that, if you can do that and the other, the other, your opponent can't do that, you have a huge edge. You will make more money over time. So, um, but it's all part of, you know, I get in like, I hate parties, like a cocktail party. Oh, that's just hell for me. If I can hold it together, if I can learn how to be, feel safe in that environment and I can act in ways that are like that, that I can be proud of in that environment, then, then like I have worlds open up for me that, that aren't uh, available right now. So that's a kind of thing that I'm working on. So that answer your question. Yeah, no, it does. And uh, I can certainly relate to this idea of picking up on subtext. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it turns out there's a whole lot going on and I just had no clue. 
And, and what are the tools that you're explore, exploring? I noticed you treated a book, your, your sort of books that you were reading, and you've got Waking the Tiger in there, which is about looking at trauma and so on. But what, what are the, yeah, what are the tools or the processes you're starting to play with about in this pursuit? Um, I use music, uh, journaling, uh, art. Um, I have this peculiar personal style of art that I just think of it as doodling, but it's really I'll uh, I'll see some blank part of something I'm working on and think, oh, here's the pattern that should go there. So I think of it as kind of an, an abstract form of the of, of, of uh, it's a map of what's going on in my head. So this is this is literally mind maps. But like I'll show you the this is what I was working on this morning. I don't know how this is. It's quite detailed. I'm doing large form format stuff. So right, yeah. And so for those who are listening on the podcast, it's lots of shapes and patterns in different colors, and yeah. And there's but there, there's there are words in there, you know. So this one started literally with this this big X, this big black X, and then like words pop into my head. So I'll just you know, and and the the ideal situation is I'll I'll be quite emotional about something i'll just sit down and go into a fugue state and i've got my pens right here i have lots and lots of pens and i just kind of don't think about it i don't plan it i just that's the next color what's the pad that's the pattern that goes oh here's a die uh, here's a word that i need to write boom, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. and then i look up and hours have passed so i think of that as a way of exploring my own experience of my emotions and these intellectual ideas also uh, that, I, that I'm trying to figure out like what's so that piece is called alone together because those are the two big words that form kind of the backbone of the, of the picture well, what's the relationship of those two words well so I just sit down and kind of look at the two words and I think, oh, I need some, I need the spirals in blue right here. Blah, blah, blah. And that leads to some red triangles and that, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, and off I go. So those are all some things that I'm doing. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I've certainly experienced that as well, that, that idea of connecting emotions to intellectual thoughts. And the more I work crestly in a, in a deep way on myself, the more I find, oh God, you know, that's why I had that bias or that you know that's why I was so adamant about that being the way right and right um it's it's because there's some part of me that was wounded and and needed this thing to be true right to, oh yeah, my yeah own more than reality right uh and then so and then as I work emotionally and release some of the trauma I find that these sort of really strongly held intellectual beliefs start to soften a bit and and sh change a bit and my intellectual viewpoint starts to move yeah. uh, i also do coaching so i do one-on-one -on -one coaching with uh high potential engineers um and that's really good for me i, I say the coach learns more than the student so the until the student becomes a coach they're kind of they're just never going to catch up um but that process is also a process of self-reflection and, and learning to trust myself. And I do lots of storytelling as part of that process and uh, uh, learning, you know, I, do, I'm, I, I just think of a story to tell you. And I've been doing that as we've been talking. I, I think of a story to tell you. And I just tell it. I don't, I don't intellectualize it. I don't think, well, what would that accomplish? And blah, blah. No, I just, my, my storytelling guru says you just wait for the story to tap you on the shoulder and then you tell it. And uh, the more that I can get into that flow, uh, the more effectively I communicate, the, the more it seems that other people can come alive in my presence. And, and that's a wonderful feeling when you see, when you, especially a geek who just thinks, oh, I'm so horribly broken because I can't keep my focus on anything and da 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 when they realize in your presence, oh, yes, I'm weird, but I'm not alone. And yes, there are things I can do about it. And then just that wah, face lights up. That's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. So I really enjoy that part of my work as well.
Right. Because, yeah, you just something just struck me there is that I'd always thought about storytelling as being, oh, well, this is a way for, um, for me to be a, a more effective communicator. Maybe I should go on a storytelling workshop and that should be my thing. But what you're saying is actually it's helped bring people alive because you kind of give them permission for them to tell their story, for them to be idiosyncratic, for them to express yeah, themselves. Yeah, yeah. And, and I ask people for their stories as well as telling them, you should still go on storytelling workshops. But but it is absolutely not about, uh, you know, hero's journey, beginning, middle, end. Here's how to stand and how to modulate your voice. That's not what's important is that is presence. I am present with you. You tell me, you know, we're, ha we're in the middle of a conversation and a story taps me on the shoulder. Do I have the presence to listen to that, to tell you that story? in in uh, 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 the best way that I can, and then let go of any need to own the outcome of that. I'll have people come up to me 10 years, 15, 20 years later and go, I was at the you know, IBM Yorktown Heights and you gave a demo and right in the middle of it, you told the story of blah, 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 and that changed my life. And I was just programming and just talking, you know, and I don't think I can be more effective as a coach than that. So that's a, that's a, certainly a thing that I do that I expect to, to grow from as well. Uh, speaking of, of which I'm starting to run out of energy. Uh, <laughs> I would, I would love to have uh, more conversation with you, uh, uh, but not right now. Uh, is there uh, anything you'd like to, uh, to close with? Do you have any goats? No, uh, goats are, goats went goats with the goats. Okay, good. So we went, that, that's, that's one tangent we won't go down, but thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's been a really powerful conversation. Um, I've got enormous amount from it. I hope our listeners have too. Um, thank you for being so honest, uh, particularly about you know, your Facebook experience. Um, there's so much more we could have got into, but it feels like we, you know, we've had a really good run through what it means to be Kent Beck. And uh, yeah, I've, I've appreciated it. So thank you. Um, the best All place right. for people to, to go to, to get more of your work and your real writings, which I... Uh, at Kent Beck on Twitter. Uh, kentbeck.com for that uh, World Wide Web interwebs thing. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, that's about it. Awesome. Well, thank you. Enjoy the thank rest you, of your Richard. day. I really appreciated the conversation. Uh, I really Thanks so much. I appreciated it too. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.